Hello, and welcome back to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we share practical tips to challenge, encourage, and most importantly, equip you as a Christian woman, wife, and mother. On today's podcast episode, we are speaking with Deborah Murky, author of the book, Murder, Motherhood, and Miraculous Grace, A True Story. Now, let me tell you, this podcast is a little selfish of me. I have wanted to be a foster mom for as long as I can remember. It's something that my husband and I really hope to be able to do someday. We're not quite to that season yet, but anytime that I have the opportunity to learn more, I am all about it. So that's why I was so excited to talk to Deborah today on this topic. You see, Deborah has been a foster mom to over 145 children and still done all the things, had her own family and, you know, all the things that come with being a wife and a mother and managed to do it all. So I really wanted some more information on what does it look like to be a foster mom? How did you do, you know, all of these things? How can we get involved even if we're not at the point yet of being able to be foster parents, you know, what are some ways, what are some steps, what do we need to know? And another reason you're going to love this interview is because Deborah has an incredible story, which she does share in her book, but she's sharing a ton of it today during this interview. I just kept asking so many questions because it had me on the edge of my seat wanting to know, okay, what happened next? Like, keep talking what happened after that. So I just know you're going to love this interview, especially if you are interested in being a foster parent someday, interested in getting involved with that, or if you are interested in true crime types of stories, this podcast episode is for you. So definitely stay tuned. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, for agreeing to talk with us today. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about your backstory? I really want to dive in today um, to your story, especially that you write about in the book and how you fostered so many children. So can you just tell us a little about you and what you've done in your life um, just to kind of set the stage for today's interview? Sure. Uh, well, I was born and raised in California, uh, but we wanted to move to the Rockies and we did that and we wanted to raise our kids here. So we did that quite a few years ago. And uh, when we did move here in 81, we had two of our children and expecting the third. And right after we had our third baby, uh, my husband and I were watching television one night uh, on a community station. And there was an advertisement saying that in our community, there was a real need for foster parenting. And my husband and I had never thought about that before. And uh, we started just discussing that and thought, you know, we, we may not have a lot, um, but we, we feel that we have a lot of love. And we had a home that we, we could take in a child that was in need, you know. So I went down the next day. We got the applications. Uh, we went through a short training. And within just months, we received our first child. We were very naive, though, at the time. and. Um, so since that time, though, we have now fostered probably somewhere around 145 children over about 18 years after that point. So tell me a little bit about the process of becoming a foster parent, um, because this is something that I have always wanted to do someday. Um, but just I'm curious, you said, OK, you went down there and a couple months later you had foster kids. Like, was it really a simple process where you filled out a couple forms or was there a lot more to it? No, there was definitely more to it um, as far as the training was not very extensive at the time, but the um, the need was very great. And I think that that had a lot to do with the training not being probably quite as extensive is the fact that they really desperately needed foster parents. And so we started with the one child and then as time went on, uh, they began to ask us if we could take a few more and and we did and we were not very aware of as far as any age group that we would or would not take uh, so we pretty much took anywhere from newborn to young teenagers as a few years went on um, we learned that there was further training you could take to be a, a therapeutic foster parent and so we took some of that training which was probably about four one or two nights a week for about four weeks and it was just a little bit more training to help foster parents be able to deal with some really hard cases and hard situations with children. So we became therapeutic foster parents 
and that from that point on, we started taking a, a, a few children that had a little bit more serious issues going on, maybe emotional um, and even uh, physical. I, at the time, had taught sign language locally, and so we also had the School for the Deaf in our community, and we took a few of the deaf students in uh, also to live with us during the school year. So that was a, a kind of a combination between social services and our local deaf school um, where we brought in different children and we we were not christians though when we first started and we did not become christians until two years after so our our purpose and our motive i think initially and naively was that we were going to be saviors to these children until we came to find the true savior. And then we realized that really God was calling us to lead these children to the true savior. That's great. So did you have a lot of children in your home at one time? Um, and did you have them for a long time? Or was it more a matter of you had a series of short-term placements? I'm just wondering how you possibly had 145 children in your home, even though, I mean, it was over a span of time, but what did that look like in your family? Certainly, there were times when we would have a child overnight, maybe just needed temporary overnight until they could locate uh, family members of that child that that, that uh, individual child or children could go to. Uh, we had them as short as overnight and as long as five years. And the reason I say five years, we did have one high schooler that we had her her senior year, and then we ended up keeping her through four years of college. So she was not still in foster care during that time, but she still did live with us for the five years. So you, we would get children from anywhere, as I said, overnight to maybe a few weeks to a few months. Sometimes there was a plan put in place for um, parents of some of these children to, they had classes they had to attend and they had some things that they had to do before the children could go back into the home. Sometimes that plan looked like anywhere from three months to six months. So we could have them that long. And then during that time, maybe we would receive one or two foster children. But since our home was approved for up to five, we might get one or two. And so there, there were many times where we were a family of 10 or a family of 12. Because at the time, we had uh, our own children living at home. Um, until later on when our two oldest went on to college and on into the military. So we were just constantly sort of evolving, I guess, through the 18 years that we were foster parents. So I'm curious then, since you had so many foster kids coming in and out of your home when your own kids were there living there as well, how did that affect your family? How did it affect your kids and your marriage and your family dynamics? Um, what kind of effect did that have? You know, there's positive and negative. And anyone interested in being a foster parent, these would be some things that I would truly love to talk with them about. Uh, you know, we had children in our home at different ages and sometimes we would have another foster child come home that was, or come in that was similar to one of their ages, like my, my youngest son. And he really enjoyed that because then he'd have another boy around his age to play with. And if there were not some serious issues with this little boy, uh, it worked out really well. There were times when we would take two or three from a family and eventually we purchased a home that we could take even more and we'd take three and four and five members of a family. So my older children as they got older became, uh, they kind of helped me to parent these children and to be a good influence to them. When that was the case it was a very positive situation. One of the situations I would always tell new foster parents is it's not wise to take children older than your own because we were, as I said, naive when we were first foster parents and the influence of the children coming into your home may be negative. And if they are older, they can be intimidating to your own children and be hurtful to your own children. So uh, there's there were times that there were very, very uh, good combinations. And there were times when we actually had to call social services and say they would have to find another placement for a child we had because they were not fitting into our home and they were causing too much turmoil. 
That would be so difficult to have to make that call. I know I've heard stories of all the things that foster kids go through. So of course you want to be there and do everything you can. Um, but that's definitely a risk. I want to know also, I was reading your bio and saw that you were involved in so many things during this time as well um, from prison ministry and crisis pregnancy center and all of these kinds of things. How did you manage um, doing life and all of the roles and responsibilities you had, you know, being a mom and taking care of a house and then having all these roles on top of that with being a foster parent as well? Well, my oldest son is in the Air Force, but when he graduated from his training, he he was commended for his um, understanding of the principle of authority and, and discipline. And he, he told his commanding officer that uh, he may have joined the Air Force, but he was really raised by an Army sergeant. And we, we, we laugh about that now. I have two sons in the military. But I look back and, you know, it wasn't that I was a mean Army sergeant, but it was discipline. It really was. And it just had to be order. And so we, you know, from the very beginning, every child that came into our home, our own children, was they were raised with it. But the children coming into our home, I think one reason they did so well was because there was such discipline. There was order. There there were certain things that had to be done at a certain time or on a certain day. Every Saturday morning was cleaning day and everyone helped and everyone had a job. And we, before school every morning, uh, all the backpacks had been packed the night before and laid out at the front door and just everything had to have an order to it. And because I worked part time in some of these other ministries, uh, I was very fortunate because I could come and go during that time. And that allowed me to be able to leave during the day to either pick up or drop off kids for school or be at school programs and things like that. So it just, uh, God just worked it all out because sometimes, to be honest with you, I look back and I'm not so sure how it all happened, but I really believe it was just, we had to set a standard and, and we had to, you know, be disciplined. All of us did. Yeah, that makes sense. And I am kind of the same way over here with we have a routine and a schedule and this is, you know, things have to be done at a certain time. Um, but there's a reason and things go so much better. And that's why I like on Equipping Godly Women, when I talk about things, which I don't as much, but talking about things like, hey, having routines and having, you know, home, like all the things for homemaking, because it really does allow you to be able to do all of these other things that God has called you to when you have a home that's orderly and you know, calm to whatever degree that you can make it. Um, but I want to shift gears a little bit because I definitely want to hear more about this book that you have um, coming out. It's going to, it will have just published at the time of this recording, um, when this recording publishes. So tell me some more about your book because I know it relates to your journey as a foster parent and one of your foster kids. Um, tell me about this. That this particular book especially starts at a time when we were living in that second home that I had told you about. We were on 10 acres of land outside of town, and the home is big enough that we could really take families. And so this particular story is about a family of five siblings that we brought into our home. And one of the children, a little four-year-old girl, just seemed to be the targeted child um, of these siblings. And the mother uh, just seemed to shun her, to be always angry at her and um, abusive toward her. And when I was a foster parent after a few years, I learned that many of these uh, parents were single moms and they really needed support and some help. And that if they could begin to look at me as not one of the bad guys, and the bad guys were caseworkers and police officers at that time, but uh, if they could begin to see me as someone that really wanted to help them and come alongside of them, uh, that maybe I'd have a, a better influence in their life. So some of them would allow me to do that. They would allow me to befriend them and to have conversations with them and maybe even take them to lunch and spend some time. This particular mother of this child, um, I, I was able to spend some more time with her. And I asked her once, I said, why? Why this child? Why are you? you know, treat this child so much differently than you do the others. And it really had to do with a loyalty as far as some of the different daddies involved with these children. There were different daddies and, uh, and some of them were jealous and one particularly, and he would treat this little girl cruelly. And so in order for this mother to keep relationship with him, she also treated this little girl cruelly. And, uh, it helped me to understand a little bit better. 
but uh, the plan was a six month plan before these children were supposed to go home after they had lived with us almost a year. And I was very, very concerned about the safety of this particular child. And the caseworker involved uh, understood that and felt the same way. So that plan was put into place and we thought we would have six months to work this out and to maybe work some things with the mother. And within a very short period of time, about a week, I suddenly had a phone call that the judge had ordered all the children to go home that day, not work a plan. So I was panicked for this child and this child was panicked. And uh, the court said I had to take them home. It was probably one of the toughest things I've really had to do was to take that child home, knowing that I was putting her in harm's way. And that's really where the book sort of begins. And it goes on beyond that of uh, not being able to know how well she was doing for almost a year. Even though I kept checking in and checking with the family, I didn't see her. I called social services. They, they said they were keeping an eye on things. But unfortunately, uh, we had a very tragic phone call after about a year after they had moved back home and her life was taken and it was devastating to us. Go on, tell us more what happened next in the story. You said that she died, but um, what happened and what happened next? Well, her mother did abuse her and, and took her life. The thing was, we did not know that and either did social services for almost a year, uh, which meant uh, when I kept checking in and other people were checking in, uh, social services really didn't have a handle on everything. This child did fall through the cracks, so to speak, and they did not realize that she had been dead for nearly a year and her body hidden. And so when they were picking up this mother on some other uh, criminal charge that uh, after that year she had committed, they contacted me and said, you know, we're trying to gather up some of her children because she is going to be going to prison for this charge and we can't find a couple of them. And we know that you were foster parent to them. Do you have any idea where they could be? And one of them, I had an idea. He was probably at a friend's that she used to always bring him there uh, when she kind of uh, been a little bit overloaded and, and overwhelmed with him. And then the little girl, uh, I said, I've been calling for a year, so I don't know where she is, but I, I feel that there's something really wrong and has been wrong for a very long time. So finally, that caseworker that was in charge at that time put um, a missing person report out for her. And when the mother was taken out of their rental home and brought to prison, the police went in and started searching the home and they found the body in the garage. And so that, again, was devastating to us as a family. But beyond that, um, even though we were crushed and we, we knew something was really wrong, that it was just one of those things you didn't want to believe that it was to that degree. And we loved this child, and we'd ask the mother if she could stay with us for a longer period of time till she got on her feet, but she kept saying no. So we were just hurt and angry and crushed. But what was... What really sort of took the twist in this whole story afterwards was we were ready to be obviously done with this mother and this family and and uh, just prayerfully hoping that our, our hurt and wounds would heal. But the next day I received a phone call from the local jail from her and she asked me to come see her. And that was a very difficult call to take. But as much as I wanted to hang up, um, of just myself and of in my own flesh, I wanted to hang up and, and didn't want to take that call. I really felt that the Lord was saying, if he had called, if she had called him, would he take the call? And if I was called myself a Christian and a follower of Christ, and I am to be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of him, should I not take that call? So I felt a very sharp and quick conviction that I needed to take her phone call. And so I did. And she asked me to come and see her at that point. That's insane. I can't even imagine. Um, I didn't realize that it, that with the little girl that it had been so long until they even found out about it and that you even knew what had happened. Um, that, yeah, I can't even imagine having, having gone through that. Um, how did your family cope with everything that had happened in the story up 
to this point, did you consider giving up being a foster parent or just, you know, not talking with them anymore? What did that look like at that time in your life? Well, interestingly enough, at that point, we had a few foster children in our home when that, when we received that information. And as I said, my whole family was devastated. My children were, they were hurt. They were angry. And then when they realized that she wanted me to come and see her and visit her, uh, they were even, they were upset with me and they could not understand why I would go and see her. At that time, I was also a lay chaplain in the community and at the jail. So I did have clearance to go see her one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, it was, it was a very difficult choice to do, but my husband said, you know, I understand if he didn't want me to go, but he said, that if you felt that God's calling you to go, then you need to go. So I did go and there, not only my children and my family, but there were some other friends in the community and in our church that also was sort of justifying me not to, to reach out to her and not to go and to not talk with her. And I, I couldn't even imagine myself of why she would want to see me. She knew how much I loved this little girl. She knew uh, that she had kept the secret from me for a year because I had seen her during that year. And I thought, what possibly could take place by me, you know, in this conversation with her. So I did go and um, it was very difficult because I, I was just sick to my stomach all the way up to the jail. I cried all the way there and I thought, how am I going to sit down and face this woman? But the Lord, I felt, gave me, gave me a real peace to be able to go into the jail and sit down and talk with her and listen. And she confessed everything to me. And um, rather explicitly, she explained exactly what she did and, and, and why she was, she had lost control, of course. And she'd been doing drugs and, and alcohol and she had just lost it. So listening to her describe what she had done was also difficult. But then I realized that that was also putting me in a very tough position. Uh, she had not even been assigned attorneys at this point. And I thought, you know, what's this now? What's going to happen um, legally? So I started now dealing with all kinds of situations that um, just by going to visit with her, I sort of allowed myself to be a part of. And as time went on, uh, she had also informed me that she was five months pregnant. Uh, going into prison. She had given birth to seven children and like I said, of a number of different daddies. And so there wasn't any really one parent left behind to take on all these children. And so she uh, approached me at one point when I went to visit her and then she asked if my husband and I would consider taking guardianship over the baby after it was born because she did not want it to go into foster care. And that was another very, very challenging, another turning point in this story um, that we were confronted with. Did you end up adopting the baby? We did. And she asked us to uh, be guardian, you know, to take guardianship. But after my husband and I prayed about it and we thought about it, we thought this is, this would not be fair to this child to just raise this child under a guardianship with a mother spending life and possibly at that point, it hadn't been determined, but even uh, the death penalty was sort of on the table. Um, and so before things were decided, we didn't know what the outcome for her life was going to be. And we said, we didn't feel that this was fair to this child. Either way, this mother was not going to be out of prison to parent this, this unborn baby once it was born. And so we said that we would not take guardianship, but we would adopt. And if we did adopt, then this baby would be our child. And so therefore, it wouldn't be a situation that we would bring this child back and forth to prison to visit her or or to do anything like that. This child would be ours and she would have to want that for this child if we were to go ahead and to adopt. So she agreed to that and she wanted us to do that and we did follow through and uh, we got one attorney. So we had the one attorney representing both sides so that we knew everything was very fair, very comfortable and we were all in agreement and there would be no problems down the road. Wow, that is just an incredible story. And I definitely would encourage anybody who just like me is like on the edge of their seat, like, what are the details? What happened? How did it all work out? 
definitely make sure that you grab um, Deborah's book, Murder, Motherhood, and Miraculous Grace. Before we wrap up today, though, I want to bring it back to the topic of foster care because um, while the story is so incredibly interesting, I want to make sure that our readers leave with something very practical and actionable that they can take action in in their own lives. So tell me, as somebody who is listening to this um, podcast right now and they're thinking, okay, I'm kind of interested in foster care. I don't know if I'm in a place where I can actually bring kids into my home right now. Obviously, we know that's an option if you can be a foster parent. Like, But yes, absolutely. It's amazing. Uh, but for somebody who's like, I'm not in that place right now where I can be a foster parent, what other options do people have where they could get involved or help out in some way without actually going through the whole certification or process? Well, if somebody did not want to be a foster parent, I, I would encourage if someone did want to move move that direction to, first of all, not only speak with their local social services, but to speak with other foster parents and ask really for some of their personal stories and some of their experiences, their pros and cons, what kind of things that they would, advice they would give, what kind of warnings. Um, you know, in other words, take it a little bit step further to talk to more people and, and really take some time to think about it and to pray about it and to evaluate their own home situation. If they decided this is not something I think we want to go to that extent, there's a program, a program excuse me, called CASA, which is really a wonderful program that you can go and be an advocate for children. You can go to court with them. You can come alongside of them and um, and be a voice for them but they're not living in your home. And that's a program that you can check into in each of your own communities. And you can find out more about that either through your court system or through law enforcement or through your social services program. And that would be just a really wonderful way to, to be, have a kind of a step in, in toward that and helping children in your community. But without, if you're not in a position to take them into your home, um, that you could still, uh, be very effective in their lives. I've heard of CASA before, but I'm not super familiar with it. Do you need some kind of background if you're taking these kids to court? Do you need some kind of background in the legal field or any kinds of qualifications, or is this more of a volunteer kind of thing? Do you know many details about that? It's more of a volunteer, and no, you don't have to have any background. There is training in it. You do have to know training because you'll have to know some of the, the legal system and how it's working and how the court system works. Um, guardian and litems, you know, are the attorneys for these children. You'll need to ha know how to work with them. And uh, you'll have to know, of course, legally what your boundaries are, you know, as a, a cause, a volunteer. So these would be all different things that um, somebody, you know, could find out about in their own community, how it works, where the training is. And uh, it is a volunteer situation. Okay. Are there other things that people can do to get involved either with helping out foster kids in a foster kind of situation or even helping out foster parents and supporting other foster parents that they may know or be able to get in contact with? Well, I think that there's a number, depending on the community um, and depending if someone's involved with their church or in their school, those would be two other great um, avenues to look into. Uh, you know, with my, my church, there were children that were in foster care that they would just provide some great activities that uh, foster children could really join in so that they were, uh, when they went back home, they, they their families also had a place to kind of come back to and found support. So local churches are a great place to check to see if how they can work side by side with social services or law enforcement to, again, help um with children that are involved in foster programs. Then also definitely the schools, the elementary schools, your junior high, high schools, to check with them. Some some communities will already have programs set up, um, but if somebody really has a heart to wanna to do something, to be involved with kids that are in uh, foster care programs and how to not only help them while they're in maybe foster care, but how can they be a support again to the families once they're back home or if they move on to be with other relatives. Uh, th this would be something that they could also uh, check into or, or develop, you know, and see how they can be creative in their own community. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. That is just crazy. Um, 
all of the things that you have done and all the things that you have been through and to go through all of that and still want to make such a difference in the lives of others and encourage other people to do the same. I think it's just wonderful. Um, before we close out this um, podcast episode today, is there anything else, any thoughts that you love to share or any last words that you want to make sure um, that you fit in here as well? I think if there's any last last words that I would like to say is that my story obviously is is a unique one in some ways and in some other ways it's not unique to what goes on in our country every day as far as children being abused and their lives being taken and I don't want that to ever discourage anyone being a foster parent we continue to be foster parents afterwards and also I would encourage them to come alongside their local social services you know um, People are only human. Uh, we all make mistakes. This particular child in this situation was uh, an unusual one. But I know that the people that work at our social service, they try to do a great job every day. And I just encourage people in the community to support them. They have a tough job. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, for talking with us today. I am going to make sure to link your book in the show notes. So if anybody has been listening to this and they're like, okay, I want the whole story. I want to know what happens. Definitely her book publishes this week. It's brand new out in the world. So go check that out. Um, make sure you get it. I'm sure it's wherever books are sold. And I'll leave a link to her website as well where you can get all of the information. Um, but thank you so much, Deborah, for talking with us today. Thank you, Brittany. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. So that just about does it for today's podcast episode. If this interview had you on the edge of your seat and you want to know the rest of the story of all the things that Deborah was talking about with her family and foster parenting, I definitely encourage you go check out her brand new book that just published two days ago called Murder, Motherhood, and Miraculous Grace, A True Story. Just hearing it in this podcast was so interesting, but you're going to be able to get all of the details there if that is something that you're interested in. And also, if you are somebody who is interested in being a foster parent or getting involved somehow with kids in need, um, check out the show notes. Not only am I going to link her book and her website, but I'm also going to link a lot of different organizations where you can get involved. And I don't know, you know, all about them yet. This is something I want to look into as well. Something that I'm really passionate about, but I'm going to leave you a bunch of links so that you have a place to get started. If you were interested in getting involved at all, go check out the show notes, um, see what kinds of things that you can get involved in. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, I would definitely encourage you go ahead and subscribe right now. There is a link in the show notes, very easy, or just, you know, hit subscribe wherever um, you are at. That would be awesome. I would really appreciate that because we come back all the time, every week, every other week um, to share great interviews and information on how you can be that amazing Christian woman that God is calling you to be. So if you love this podcast, definitely subscribe if you have not already, and we'll see you back here again real soon. All right. Bye.